A lake isn't only full of water; it's full of potential energy. Hydropower, a renewable energy source that uses little more than the power of gravity. At present, some 20% of the world's electricity supply is generated by some form of hydropower technology. Even the most colossal of hydropower plants emit no pollutants or greenhouse gases. The decisive advantage of hydropower is that it's renewable; it can be regenerated, and it has an unbeatably high degree of efficiency. Hydropower is highly economical as well. It's one of the cheapest of all energy sources, and so the world is seeing a construction boom in new dams and power plants, especially in developing and emerging countries. But many of the larger-scale projects have raised serious concerns. Hydropower is easier on the environment than other energy resources, but it still causes ecological and especially social problems. Social problems arise when hydropower projects come into conflict with the interests of local residents. The controversies around hydropower can often be traced back to social conflicts. The most important question is who really profits from hydropower. Renewable energy's expert Govind Pokharel, on the other hand. Believes hydropower holds the key to the economic development of his country, Nepal. Throughout the Himalayas, as here in the Dolaka region, wood is the main source of energy. Pokharel sees great new opportunities in hydropower and not in fossil fuels. Even if you go to Saudi Arabia, maybe Gulf region, the oil is pumped by the. Uh, state-owned company or private companies, but hydropower, you see, from east to west, it's, it's a decentralized resources, and you 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 should have a, some policy, some framework, which utilizes these decentralized resources for the benefit of the local people as well as the people who are interested to invest in it, on it. Perched high in the mountains, far from the capital Kathmandu, is the village of Mangaltar. Its people have lived in poverty for untold generations. Pokharel is a familiar face here. The farmers' desperation is such that they have often sold their daughters into prostitution in India, knowingly or unknowingly. Here, those days, it's hoped, are past. The standard of living has been improving for years. A ritual Buddhist greeting for the man who is bringing electricity to these villages. Hydroelectricity. Pokharel grew up in a village much like this. He knows how much the people cling to their customary way of life. He had to sit through many a ceremony and do lots of talking to win their trust. The effort seems to have paid off. The electricity for the village comes from a small power plant driven by a mountain stream just a few hundred meters away. The villagers pitched in to help build their own power supply. The mini power plant is designed simply enough that it can be maintained with no outside help. The electricity comes at virtually no cost. The farmers produce and harvest it themselves, but Govind Pokharel sees this as only one small first step. They can be fed into the national grid, where then community can sell electricity to the national grid, and community can earn money. Because now community are using energy only for four or five hours, 
So remaining 18 to 20 hours, they are producing electricity, but there is no market. So they can sell that electricity to the yes. government, national grid, and the people will get money. And that money can be invested for the health sector, education, and so on. Those people, people will become rich. From the outside, not much seems to have changed about Mangaltar. Its 140 families have lived here for generations. But now, for the first time, they all have electricity, something not even the population of Kathmandu can claim. Nepal's cities are plagued by power shortages and outages. These farmers have never had any help from the central government. And Nepal has never had a nationwide power grid nor is it likely to be able to afford one in the near future. This is why Govind Pokharel sees decentralized local power supplies from renewable sources as the optimal solution for the time being. They have to be cheap and simple enough for anyone to handle. Many houses in Mangaltar also now have their own little natural gas unit. For now, it's mostly the younger generation who's embracing the new technologies. The older people are amazed at how quickly life in this remote village is changing. We have electricity now, and it's a big help, especially for the youngsters. We used to have to study in the dark and work in the fields during the day. It was hard to learn anything. Now all four of my children have gone on to secondary school. They've left the village in search of a better life. One son is now living in the capital, and one daughter went to Japan. Who would have imagined? On a national scale, too, hydropower can be highly profitable. All around the world, major electric power corporations are operating or planning mega-projects. 20 to 30 percent of Brazil's power needs are supplied by this one plant, Itaipu, in the border state of Paraná. Itaipu can put out as much as 12 nuclear plants. But even on such a grand scale, the technology is classed as a clean energy source. It produces no toxic waste nor atmospheric emissions. But vast areas of rainforest were sacrificed and some 40,000 Indios forcibly resettled to build Itaipu. Future projects must not wreak such havoc, says Professor Celio Berman. For these new projects, the national governments can no longer ignore the interests and real needs of the people in the affected areas. Otherwise, the new power plants will just be a new source of bad press. That's the case in many countries. If the planners would only start taking the needs of the local people into consideration, even the really big power plants and dams could benefit everyone. What's needed is more communication and transparency. The citizens have to be involved in the decision-making process. Often they're not even informed of the plans. They ought to have the right to make their own proposals and take part in making decisions. The project might cost more in the short term, but in the long term, it'll end up costing less, and it will be more sustainable besides. Antonio Fonseca dos Santos works for Brookfield Energia, an energy company that has begun to put this new thinking into practice. The time is past when maximizing profit was the only objective. Now, the long-term effects of projects are intensively studied and discussed. Ways have to be found to build new plants without causing unacceptable damage to the surroundings. This is all part of the ideal power plant as envisioned by engineers and planners. On the one hand, designed for minimal environmental impact, and on the other, large enough to supply electricity to many communities and generate sufficient profit. It's possible for hydropower to achieve all three of these objectives. The Pedrinho 1 plant was built on the site of a natural waterfall. Migratory fish that once overcame the waterfall can still clear the dam. This isn't the case with many other hydropower plants. The plant's outlet is built to resemble a natural riverbed, as if the river itself ran through the dam. So the migratory paths of aquatic life have been preserved intact. 
The project plans were also coordinated with nearby communities before construction began. The deputy mayor of the largest town in the area demanded some concessions that would benefit or compensate the local people. A great deal of initial mistrust had to be overcome, and now it has been. Antonio Fonseca dos Santos has made it his mission to find ways to provide clean energy that harm no one. To do that, he has to consider the interests of all parties. When discussion of the project started in our community, lots of rumors were going around. Everybody was very anxious. No one knew just what would happen. And then you joined forces and negotiated with my company. And right away we got more compensation from the government. All too often, the energy companies allow the local people no input whatsoever. Even the requirements of Brazilian law have typically been ignored. In such cases, those affected have little chance to defend their interests. In the case of Pedrinho 1, Brookfield Energia considered the wishes and needs of local communities and built roads and a school. So the new power plant resulted in an overall improvement for the region. Now the construction of a second plant in the area is under discussion in the town hall of Sao Roque. Funds have always been tight here, so the deputy mayor had an extra incentive to come to terms. Even so, Josemara Dalagnol knows from experience that she can expect fairness from Brookfield Energia. The region provides the water, and the power it produces helps to develop the region. Global energy consumption has risen sharply in recent years. In many of the megacities in developing nations, the situation is rapidly turning critical. The populations of most developing countries are still booming. More and more people are migrating to the big cities in search of jobs and better lives. And they're consuming ever more energy. In rapidly emerging nations like Brazil, improving standards of living means higher energy consumption. Much of Brazil's energy needs are met by hydropower. And barely a fraction of its potential has so far been tapped, which puts the country's energy companies in a good position to promote the building of even more hydropower plants, environmentally friendly or not. Dozens of sites amid the untouched Amazon rainforest are now slated to be developed for hydropower projects in the name of progress and electricity. Not only will the colossal dams inundate large areas of wilderness, they'll also expose the soil to erosion, contaminate drinking water and promote the spread of infectious disease. And if the forest isn't cleared before it's flooded, the rot will give off methane, a greenhouse gas. In underdeveloped northern Brazil, the indigenous people have an even more perilous hold on their land than elsewhere in the country. Their protests have fallen on deaf ears. This hydroelectric dam will mean destruction for us who live there. There's no way that we accept it. God gave us this marvelous river. We can fish here and never have to buy fish. So none of the Indians will accept the dam. Govind Pokharel is exploring new ways to develop and use hydropower optimally in his country. The many local power systems he's building in the mountain villages are merely a drop in the ocean of Nepal's poverty. The rivers coming down from the Himalayas have far more potential. Nepal urgently needs more and larger power plants to supply power to its cities. But here too, there's growing distrust of such large-scale projects. It's taking ever greater public relations efforts to win the population over to them. As in Brazil, the local people have learned to fight for concessions. Throughout the country, there are rivers with large untapped energy reserves. But investment capital from abroad is urgently needed, as are stricter criteria for the approval of the many projects in planning.
Govind Pokharel elaborates. The main thing is now we have to also tell the local people what to what extent they have to negotiate. They, they have to see not only from the monetary benefit but also the ecological environmental perspective. In the European Union, the criteria for the use of hydropower are strictly defined, and the maximum potential under those criteria seems to have now been reached. But hydropower can do more than make electricity. This pumped storage hydropower station in the Austrian state of Vorarlberg is one of the most advanced hydropower plants on Earth. The turbines have a combined capacity of 525 megawatts. Deeper inside the mountain is the pumping station. Site manager Ernst Pura explains its purpose. Given the development of alternative sources like solar and wind energy, where the yield does not always coincide with demand, it may become necessary to save the surplus energy, and that's what the pumping storage plant does. Whenever there's a surplus of energy, water is pumped from the valley 800 meters up to a reservoir. Later, when shortfalls need to be compensated, it shoots back down through shafts inside the mountain to drive the plant's turbines. For many years, the area serviced from the plant's control room was confined within Austria's borders. But wind and solar energy are growing by leaps and bounds. More and more power is being diverted across the border and stored on the mountain slopes. The national power grids have been combined into an international network. The demand for this service is on the increase, even in countries outside the producer storage network. So we need to build more pumped storage stations. China has some very big ones, but in fact all the countries that are expanding their alternative energy systems will eventually see a demand for these pumped storage systems. Back in Brazil, people in the state of Rio Grande do Sul are also exploring new uses for hydropower. The soybean boom has brought new prosperity to this region. Still, many small farmers are giving up. Since the power grid was privatized, energy prices have risen out of their reach. For many years, Umberto Francisco Toazza and Sergio Miotto were union activists for small farmers. Now they manage hydroelectric plants for a cooperative of 600 farming families called Cryral. In the Rio Lobo Valley, a three megawatt power plant is nearing completion, the cooperative's largest project to date. It will supply power to even more members, and much cheaper than a commercial power company would. People here are taking control of their own region's development. The cooperative's members pooled their money to build their first two mini power plants. None of the banks would grant a loan to simple farmers, says Umberto Francisco Toazza. At first, it all seemed so impossible, but we never gave up. We immediately reinvested the revenues from the first little plants. Now the banks trust us, even with such a large project as this. We cover our expenses with the power we generate here. Even the small farmers began making big profits, which opened up new possibilities for tapping the potential of hydropower and provided another way for private individuals to earn money. There are still many villages in Rio Grande do Sul without power, but the Cryral farmers produce enough to supply business partners as well. Towering grain elevators now have electricity. The cooperative's members have essentially built their own energy infrastructure out of their own pockets, something normally only large corporations can do. Nowadays, upwards of 60 cooperatives are pursuing similar goals. The people of this region call themselves gauchos, not to be confused with the well-known gauchos of the Argentinian Pampas. 
What they both have in common, though, is a determination to live and shape their own lives as they see fit. Govin Pokorel has a look at one of Nepal's largest hydropower facilities. The Kim T1 hydropower plant in the Ramachop region was built by a private Nepali-Norwegian consortium. But relative to what the country needs, it's only a drop in the bucket. Electricity is strictly rationed, even for the few industrial operations. If this plant succeeds, Pokorel hopes it will mean a breakthrough for the economy. The power plant itself lies deep inside the mountain. The 160 million euro construction cost by itself would have been far beyond the means of the national budget. Yet its 60 megawatt capacity covers about one-seventh of Nepal's current needs. The turbines have to be in perfect working order for the end of the dry season. Once the rains set in, they'll be running at full capacity and generating surpluses that in the future may be exported to neighboring India with its near insatiable hunger for energy. Today is a big day. The financial backers from Norway are expected. For many years, the Norwegians kept their distance, not putting any more of their capital into Nepal than absolutely necessary. But this power plant may well signal the beginning of a beautiful friendship. The new friends pose for a photo op in front of a new school, built with company money. The investors have even invited the Norwegian ambassador to the ceremony. After long negotiations, the investors agreed to divert a percentage of the profits to the local villages to be invested as the residents see fit. It's only a small expense item for the managers from far off Europe, but for the local people, it's a meaningful sign that their needs and wishes are taken seriously. The usage rights are ceremoniously presented to the local villages. The plant's general manager, Tom Solberg, sees this as just the first step. Norway was one of the poorest countries in Europe, uh, if you go back a hundred years. And uh, Norway built its uh, industrial base from hydropower. And Norway did not have money to uh, invest in hydropower, so the money came from abroad, from Germany, from uh, England, from other countries. And Nepal has the opportunity to do exactly the same. Now people from the mountain villages all around are joining together. Until recently, Nepal and the Kimti River Valley were torn by civil war, preventing investment and hindering development. The political conflicts are not yet resolved, but now a new project has united the people of this valley. Much as in Brazil, they're pooling resources to found a hydropower cooperative. It can only work if it's kept as democratic as possible and even traditional adversaries among the political parties are now working together. But Govind Pokorel and plant manager Shyam P. Bata realize that much remains to be done. I think the government should come with a clear picture so that the private sector will be confident and the community will be also confident yeah. to resolve the ongoing conflict or any conflict that can come in. Yeah, I agree fully. In fact, we have to reach a situation where the community doesn't even have to bargain. bargain that yeah. their certain rights are ensured. Yeah. At the same time, there are certain responsibilities that they have to fulfill. Yeah. So it's not a question of somebody asking, yeah, begging, and somebody, and somebody giving, giving yeah. but there is rights on both parties. How can hydropower be used optimally? The natural water cycle itself continually replenishes this energy source, acting with and not against the climate. But hydropower does have its downside. Colossal dams and reservoirs displace populations and destroy valuable land, both cultivated and natural. The growing demand for energy from ever-growing cities all but forces the proliferation of such projects. But there are some that show how it can be done differently. Often they're simple, decentralized plants that produce lots of energy with little expense. These projects stand as examples of how the interests of all concerned can be respected and even served, and of how the people can have a share in the profits. 
hydropower can exist in full harmony with the climate. And if applied judiciously, it can even help promote social justice and prosperity. The worst global problem is still poverty. Unless we overcome poverty, we're not going to make any progress fighting climate change. And to do that, we need cheap energy. Only with cheap energy, like we get from hydropower, can we effectively fight poverty. It's the only way we can stop the destruction of nature and the climate.